Hello and welcome to another episode of Forkful of Noodles. I am Krish Mohan. Winners and losers. Our current president is very concerned with those things. I mean, someone should tell him that running a country is not like running a race. Although, some of his diehard supporters might say that it's exactly like NASCAR. But if you look at the state of capitalism that this administration is a part of, it's pretty much exactly like NASCAR. We're just going around in a circle burning fossil fuels while those in the stands keep drinking beer to sedate themselves to, with, with pride to think that this cycle is actually doing something great for them. And then eventually, there's a fiery crash where we just bail out the car and get it back on the road instead of thinking we should probably slow down a little bit and think about what we're racing around in this circle for anyway. This version of capitalism, the one in which we currently practice, runs on consumerism, competition, and greed. According to Trump, the rich people should run this country because they're rich and they know how to make everybody else rich, right? But knowing that knowledge and sharing it are two completely different things, right? And it's proof that greed is truly what runs this nation, just like beer and redundancy is truly what runs NASCAR. Rich people don't want to make other rich people. I mean, they want to hoard all of their riches to themselves, right? Fans of DuckTales will remember that none of those riches gets recirculated into the economy. I mean, it's mostly used as an ineffective swimming pool, which is a dick move to all the poor people who could use some of those riches to to feed themselves or have affordable medicine or technology to better their lives or even save them. Shit, maybe some of those riches could be used for actual poll passes. Now, the conservative argument is that you pick yourself up by your bootstraps and work hard and do better than the person sitting next to you. Then you'll get all the riches. Well, I mean, what if you don't have boots? Where do you go from there? Capitalism sold all the affordable boots, and the highest bidder is selling each part of the boot at a higher markup to people that don't even need boots. But Krish, the rich people who bought the boots are creating jobs and are helping people earn money so that they can buy more bootstraps. Yeah, I don't really think so. The jobs aren't created by the rich. They are created by a cycle of consumerism. Rich people like me don't create jobs. Jobs are a consequence of an ecosystemic feedback loop between customers and businesses. And when the middle class thrives, businesses grow and hire, and owners profit. It's basically supply and demand. We have been demanding better jobs with better pay and the rich have not supplied us with anything except excuses and distractions. The rich aren't saying, hey guys, we're gonna go ahead and uh, fire everyone and move this factory to Mexico and take all your jobs with us because see, here's the thing, we like money and and we'd like to keep it and then we'd like to count it obsessively to make sure that it's all there and mexico uh well they're desperate for jobs so we really kind of don't have to pay them all that much right and and well what okay so what what about you guys uh well i hear that mcdonald's is probably hiring But listen, I gotta go because it's been like six minutes since I counted my money last and it kind of gets lonely without me. Instead, the rich are saying, look how shiny that thing is. And then they run the opposite direction, snickering like a cartoon villain, probably twirling their little mustaches too. And because rich people 
want to stay rich and continue to get richer, they don't pay taxes. And then when they're told that they need to pay taxes, that's when we find out that they've been hiding all of their money to evade those taxes. Slew of shocking revelations about how the world's richest people stash away billions of dollars in wealth in offshore tax havens. The revelations, known as the Paradise Papers, implicate more than a dozen of President Trump's cabinet members, advisors, and major donors. Among them, Wilbur Ross, who's continued to conduct business with Vladimir Putin's son-in-law through a shipping company, even after Ross became Trump's press uh, commerce secretary. The shipping company, Navigator Holdings, is also linked to a Russian oligarch subject to U.S. sanctions. The papers also show President Trump's Secretary of State, Rex Tillerson, was the director of a Bermuda Incorporated oil and gas company linked to ExxonMobil, which ran a controversial scheme to export tens of millions of barrels of natural gas from the oil fields in western Yemen. Trump's chief economic advisor, Gary Cohn, served as president or vice president of 22 separate companies based in Bermuda between 2002 and 2006 while he was at Goldman Sachs. The registered addresses of all 22 Bermuda-based companies were 85 Broad Street in Manhattan, then the headquarters of Goldman Sachs. And they're hiding their money in these gorgeous islands that people used to go on vacation to, which is a dick move too. Most middle class folks can't afford a vacation to go to the Caribbean, right? So, so they're more likely to settle for Calcutta, Ohio. Meanwhile, the ultra rich corporatocracy's money is getting a vacation. Just a bunch of hundred dollar bills, tanning on the beach, drinking bojitos, well, and paying for it with the, with single dollar bills, which is awful because that means that classism exists even for inanimate objects like the dollar bill. And this blatant tax evasion and destructions of jobs proves that the rich are just hoarding their money like, like a NASCAR enthusiast hoards NASCAR commemorative plates. I mean, it just seems unnecessary and, and excessive. And it's proof that consumerism is the key factor in capitalism. Look at the fact that our economy is based on consumption and advertising is the arm of creating artificial demand. And without that arm, and it's so polluted as you know, I, mean, I can't even imagine what the world would be like without advertising, but without that arm you wouldn't have people aspiring to things that are highly irrational, abused by our social inclusion when advertising presents something to the community that seems to be something that some people want it spreads like a virus and then everybody wants it because it's an issue of social inclusion which is a part of our biology because that's how we identify we identify and define ourselves by how others see us and how we are included in the group and that's why nascar is so good at capitalism it's a cyclical reminder to buy more shit we see a car with Tide written on it, and, and we're probably going to buy more laundry detergent, even though we only own one shirt and no pants or food. I mean, we would know when the deep state is starting to get desperate, when they start taking ad space on NASCAR, right? When the fuck Venezuela car comes out, that's when you know that's some desperate propaganda right there. The tech industry is run on consumerism for a product that today is very necessary. But 25 years ago, I mean, having a phone in your car was a ludicrous idea. But we are heading towards a world where we won't be able to get into a car without a phone. I mean, driving will not be for peasants and serfs. And neither will it be for people that want to stop texting and driving. We are going to encourage it. And we are going to make sure that you are, you are Instagramming where you are going, how you're getting there, and when you get there. Okay? How else will people know that you truly exist and are alive? But the problem comes when we can't afford some of the necessary technology because the rich haven't really shared the wealth. Right? A, a lot of Americans work two jobs to put food on the table and according to the bootstraps ideology those people should be the real billionaires but with the workaday folks can't think about 
be the consumerism, let alone participate in it. Is just as important as the ideal. If you want to see where the material comes from, it's shaped by ideas. But, and here comes his radicalism, it runs the other way too. The ideas don't come from nowhere, they come out of the real world. The ideas we have as people have to do with the real material problems we have as human beings and how we solve them. Where do we get our food? Where do we get our shelter? How do we get protection as little children from the elements, from our parents? All of these real material matters of life and survival are shaping our ideas every bit as much as our ideas shape the reality. But fear not, citizens. The rich have created credit. For example, when people couldn't buy in the 1970s, the capitalist system kept going anyway. How did it do that? How did it keep going when it, the people didn't have enough money from their wages to buy? The solution was credit. We loaded the world up. House credit, that's your mortgage. Car payment credit, nobody buys a car except by paying out. Credit cards, which didn't exist before the 1970s for anything but traveling businessmen and only a small number of them. And then when that was not enough, we loaded up for the first time in American history an entire generation of students who can't get a degree without loading up with tens of thousands of dollars of debt. We kept the system going. People could buy stuff even though their wages didn't pay for it by borrowing. And you can borrow money from the banks and participate in consumerism. Mainly because of the interest that's charged. Because we ch in capitalism, every product has to have something that makes money, excuse me, that makes a profit. And then when the sale of money, which is what banks do, they create and sell money effectively. You know, when they lower and raise interest rates, they're, they're changing the price of what it's going to cost you to get money and a loan. And then they produce interest, obviously, and that interest doesn't exist in the money. So the banks create money and sell it to you with interest? Wait, we are selling money. We put a price tag on the dollar bill and the math isn't adding up. And we would all know this information if we were better at math and not proud of our in uh, ignorance about it. I'd tell you how far down the list America ranks in education, but we don't know because that's how bad at math we are. They're selling the very thing this economy is run on. And selling money is why NASCAR makes sense to people. It's like getting caught in a time loop. I mean, this is proof that our economy is run on imagination and society says that imagination is only for kids and i really wish that kids invented more shit about the economy because then it would be more fun you know trading video game cartridges uh, or, or juice boxes instead of stocks bonds and tips on crushing the spirit of poor people and the credit system doesn't even make any sense, right? That you have better credit the more you're in debt? Well, isn't the point to be out of debt so you can buy more shit and then maybe go back into debt? No, it's to keep you in the constant loop of debt. It's, it's like the, the golf points loop of debt. And there's no security in it either, right? When you use your debit card, you need to put in your PIN, an eyeball scanner, a spit test. And with credit, you can just squeal a little line and that's close enough to your name. So when your if information and card is actually stolen, who cares? As long as the robber is buying shit you or they don't need. And this debt is what keeps our economy running. So you have today about 200 trillion in debt in the world and about 80 trillion in currency. So what does that mean? It means that those that are holding the bag in the lower class are the ones that get screwed when you have economic declines. There are always going to be bankruptcies and things like that that happen in a kind of classism, the structural classism that I call it, that effectively hurts the lower class. And the fact that people don't see that either. I mean, debt goes back 5,000 years. It has been in lockstep of something else that we're familiar with called slavery. So debt peonage, slavery, convict leasing. Uh, the, even today in certain areas of Asia, they have debt that's passed through generations from farmer to child. 
A negative balance for the average working class citizen means great capital gains for the rich that want to have all of their money, which is based in nothing. Which means the rich are convincing us middle and lower classes that we need to be more in debt to get all of the riches for absolutely nothing. I'd say we're competing over peanuts, but that is a thing that's based in reality. Our economics is not. And since our economy is based on nothing, it makes a whole lot of sense why churches get roped up into the capitalistic system. Both religion and capitalism say a bunch of really nice things to help people, but in reality, they're just run by something imaginary, which gets all the credit and the invisible hand of the free market might as well be called god with how many people that have died or been screwed over in its name and the two-party system yeah they're certainly worshiping it debt is incredibly important to keep capitalism running because it justifies greed it's putting a dollar sign on everything. I mean, education has a dollar sign and a red mark that follows you to, to the grave and beyond. Sally Mae is working on a way to grab money from the dead because student loans will follow you into the afterlife. Hell, the funeral industry is the epitome of putting a dollar sign on death. We are just walking currency to capitalists. And we are kept nicely distracted from all of this, right? This is why when jobs disappear and instead of blaming the capitalist rich person that's trying to turn over a buck on the back of poor people elsewhere, we blame immigrants amongst other things. And I pick it because it's so relevant right now in the United States and around the world. Every capitalist I think most of the folks watching know this just from their personal life. Every capitalist is always trying to either make more money or survive competitively by saving on his labor costs. One capitalist does it by substituting machines for working people, automating, getting a computer to do what he used to have 50 people do, etc., etc. Another capitalist does it by trying to get cheaper workers in place of more expensive ones, hiring women if they're less expensive to do the job that they used to pay men more for, hiring immigrants rather than native folks, moving to another part of the world where wages are much lower. We, we all, all know that. So capitalists are always trying to save on labor costs because they can make a better profit if they do that. Immigrants are blamed because the desperate working class is told that they cut in line. They en they're entering the race with an advantage. They stole your job and they came into your house whilst you slept your slumber of ignorance. They took your ID card and the keys to your Chevy and that Chevy was your ticket in a NASCAR. And even if that was true, the corporatocracy doesn't care as long as they are going to buy shit with the money they made from that stolen job. There is an exodus of capitalists from where capitalism was invented. They're going to nations where there are more people, less wealth, and fewer opportunities. Then the capitalists come in to create opportunities for less. And then they start to cycle all over again. So eventually the capitalists believe that they can bring jobs back into the country where capitalism was created to feed the desperate people they abandoned before. But the world has progressed and we are shifting the way we work and what it means to work. To work. So this cycle doesn't work. It's like your ex-girlfriend who crushed your heart calls you and says, Hey, I love you, and I'm not going to change or learn from my past mistakes um, and still treat you just as bad as I did before. I'll probably also insult your mother and call your best friend a misogynistic man whore. So you, you want to fuck? No. No, I do not, Darlene, okay? I, I blocked you and your number. Okay, so stop getting burner phones to call me and convince me that a bad idea is a good one. 
Then the capitalists used the sensational propaganda machines, aka mainstream media, to announce the scapegoats of technology and women and immigrants and the chupacabra, you know, and still push consumerism and credit to keep the ca their capitalist masters in the race. This means that we never really got rid of slavery. We just redefined it and expanded it. Which is why we don't progress as a society, but keep running on the treadmill of NASCAR. But this is the desperation that is created by the greed of first world capitalism. And rampant capitalism is now a public health issue. The idea is people working two jobs should be able to rise to the top if capitalism worked the way it should. But because of greed and deregulation, that's not the case. And greed and deregulation of things like insurance companies, pharmaceuticals, the banks, corporate entities, and, and more, that, that means that people aren't able to afford things like health care and good food. And it's literally killing people. <laughs> So if you kill the people on the stands of NASCAR, who will buy your cyclical advertised propaganda? And this propaganda is what keeps us blind to the capitalistic classism that exists in most rich countries. But the fact that poverty exists anywhere is an inherent flaw of capitalism. Let's talk about the inefficiencies of the capitalist model versus the possibilities that exist today with modern technology. Paint a picture juxtaposing this crazy comparison from food to energy. Well, the greatest inefficiency would be the fact that we have poverty at all. So we talk about this advancement of society and this great productivity. The most powerful force, the most positive force we do have of the whole of human civilization is since the Industrial Revolution, we're able, we're able to do more and more and more with less and less and less. And that is the driving force that can create equitable, equitable distribution and peace on this planet. So the fact that you have five people now with more wealth than the bottom half of the world, and you have close to a billion people not getting their nutrition met, and you have what in an, by uh, Peter Edwards of Newcastle University put out what he called the ethical poverty line, which is based on lifespan, not the metrics put out by the UN. And when you use this ethical poverty line, you find that 60% of the world is actually in poverty. That is, is lunacy from an efficiency standpoint. No one can sit there and claim that this is an efficient system. Capitalism that creates class inequalities is inefficient when you make shit that nobody can buy creating a, the system is like a snake that's eating itself and then shits itself out and starts eating itself again it's like nascar right and, the, and a car crashes and people are more concerned about fixing the car just to make sure that there is something to keep that race going and as long as human beings want to keep having babies, there will always be a supply of people to be added to this never-ending race. The American dream is that everyone can be rich. Well, if everyone is rich, then nobody's rich. We'd all be in the middle. And this is creating a lot of pressure for people that to work and be rich instead of work and be happy. And... The advertisement of the American dream is linking happiness with money, and since capitalism doesn't make wealth for consumers of the middle class, we're stressed out and have money-related health problems, which means that capitalism is a disease, and Big Pharma doesn't really have a pill to cure that because they are a symptom of the disease. But... All of this is done because the capitalists are desperate to keep their riches, their statuses, and their power. In a changing world where poverty is created by greed-based capitalism, people have to lean on each other and work together to survive, which means that the consumer will eventually control the market and the wealth of the wealthy will be taken away by their own greed and the cannibalistic nature of this system means that they will run out of supply and demand for the sake of having all 
of their imaginary currencies. Through the advertisement of America, we are told to do less work for more money. The more you're in demand, the higher the cost of your supply. But that's the opposite of what supply and demand is really about. The supply should be controlled by the demand. The more it's in demand, the lower the cost of the supply should be. Then the supplier makes money and the demanders actually have what they want. It's the only way capitalism can survive, by making friends with socialism. If not, capitalism will continue to cannibalize itself and there's no money in eating yourself. That's not what winners do and that's a loss for everyone involved. Necessity is the mother of invention. At the moment, capitalism, fueled by greed, creates poverty and scarcity to get inventions that it can profit from. It's why daydreaming at office jobs has increased by 95% in the last decade. Capitalists believe that if they put economic pressure on us plebes, we'll solve all the problems they've created. Have some personal responsibility. Hell, at this point, we'd take like 1% of personal responsibility. With the cycle of poverty and debt that capitalism uh, traps people in, like a fat spider traps other spiders, there aren't too many people who can throw their wallets into the consumerist rat race. But some capitalists have seen the damage that is created and are pushing for universal basic income. Capitalists like Tesla's Elon Musk and Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg have been pushing for UBI over the last few months. Facebook actor Jesse Eisenberg has not made any remarks about universal basic income, probably because he's not that much of a character actor. If this was Daniel Day-Lewis, you know, well, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis literally died after he played Lincoln. I mean, that's an actor. First, let's talk about what universal basic income is. I've talked about it in two different videos, but I'll give you guys a quick recap. UBI, as the cool kids call it, is a viable solution to progressing the labor force and curing greed-based and cannibalistic capitalism. It's giving citizens a second leg up financially to cover essential needs like rent and food. It revitalizes the middle class and puts the economy back in the hands of the consumer instead of billionaires who own the economy, poverty, and debt. Now, some people wrap this with the welfare system, and they say that it's just a bunch of handouts. Now, I'd agree with that if the capitalists didn't hoard all of their money so it doesn't get recirculated into the economy. And... I'd agree with that if we bailed out the citizens instead of the banks in the moment of a financial crisis. I'd agree with that if homeless people didn't ask for more than one dollar to feed themselves or sometimes get drugs. But even, even then a dollar can't even get you half a sandwich, let alone a hit of heroin. Let's be clear, UBI is not a handout. It's balancing the scales. So why are some of these big titans of capitalism pushing for universal basic income if it means that they can't hoard their wealth? First of all, most billionaires don't spend more than the average American. That there can never be enough super rich people to power a great economy. Somebody like me makes hundreds or thousands of times as much as the median American. But I don't buy hundreds or thousands of times as much stuff. My family owns three cars, not 3,000. I buy a few pairs of pants and shirts a year like most American men. Occasionally we go out to eat with friends. I can't buy enough of anything to make for the fact that millions of unemployed and underemployed Americans can't buy any new cars, any clothes, or enjoy any meals out. Sure, I mean, some of them are buying star-studded pants, but they still have to put their pants on one leg at a time or, or or they're getting their butler to put their pants on one leg at a time but 
they're not buying extra pants. There, there's no extra income to flood the economy. So all of this money could get reallocated to we the people. The other reason is related to the future of labor. Capitalists like Zuckerberg and Musk see that automation is the future of the labor force. Robots will be stealing your jobs and eventually it'll be robot Mexicans, which is the fear of every conservative Texan conspiracy theorist. And look, automation is already here. Every capitalist I think most of the folks watching know this just from their personal life. Every capitalist is always trying to either make more money or survive competitively by saving on his labor costs. One capitalist does it by substituting machines for working people. Grocery stores have had self-checkout lines for over a decade now, and that's eventually going to be taken over by a robot because consumer hands are too delicate to scan a barcode. Hell, the alarm clock has automated the sunrise. Chickens were pissed when they were put out of a job, but they found a new purpose, food, which I'll admit is the fear that we all have. When are we going to be turned into food? Is, is Soylent Green the next step to automation? No, the creation of a Tesla perfume just called Musk probably is. Now, there are a lot of people that are saying that automation's replacement of human workers is far from becoming a reality, such as conservative radio host Ben Shapiro. And everybody just relax, put the pitchforks down, put the mace down, let's see what he's got to say. So I think that universal basic income is for when the technology gets so good that there legitimately are no jobs. I don't think that we're there yet. So if you have a machine that can make everything basically for free, and then there's a bunch of people who you don't need anymore to do work, then you can talk about a universal basic income because there's no scarcity. Scarcity right. is what creates a need for labor. So if there's scarcity in any industry, then there's going to be a need for, for labor. There's going to be a need for new labor. People are going to still have to you know, work on these trucks and deal with technology. And the computer industry didn't destroy jobs all over the United States when typewriters went out. So I think it's a little premature. I'm not sure there will ever be a day when there's a machine that when the machine society is so well developed that it can take over all jobs. I do think you're seeing a bifurcation in the labor market. So I think people who are in jobs like yours and mine, like we're lucky. This is a creative job. It's hard for machines to create. But for jobs that are single task jobs, a lot more of those are going to be technologically driven. And so people are going to have to, you know, work the right side of their brain a little bit. We're going to have to train people in a different way. But my, my perspective on universal basic income is when you have a 4% unemployment rate, it's very difficult to say you need a universal basic income. Like right. it, it's, it, now, look, uh, look I, I do like Ben Shapiro, even though I don't always agree with him. But he brings up a valid point, you know. But look, computers didn't replace human beings from typing. They replaced the typewriter which has about 15 percent less emotions and feelings than the average human when the robots and the algorithms replace human beings typing which if you count voice recognition technology they kind of already are then the typists the secretaries and the fans of pen and paper are going to be replaced and they're going to need something to do but if their passion wasn't typing they'll probably find what they need to do and working a job is just something to do right it's it's just necessary but if necessity is the mother of invention then these folks will figure out what their passion is and if they have a financial buffer to help them with that we might start progressing as a society at this point work is a necessary distraction the labor force is about survival instead of producing something meaningful. UBI gives people an opportunity to go back to, to thinking about how, uh, how to better each other's lives and create more things and actually progress our society instead of funding wars and scapegoating and supporting modern day gladiator games. 
At this point, the only place where human beings are creating and inventing something is on late night infomercials, selling crap to insomniacs for three easy payments of nineteen ninety five with a free gift. Call now to keep yourself distracted from your true purpose. I think the world has enough tape that can temporarily fix our problems. And besides, we've already got duct tape, and that has literally fixed everything. I mean, like, I drove a car where someone broke into my vehicle and and busted out my glass, and I had plexiglass that was held together by duct tape for eight months. I mean, that's how good duct tape is. I feel like we don't really need to go and invent just variations of duct tape that isn't duct tape. UBI would veer us away from the argument about minimum hourly wage and towards the actual meaning of work. I mean, right now, for an extra hour of work at $15 an an hour can mean an additional $15,000 for those at the top, but only $15 for that worker. And it may be the case that you know, we've moved, we're moving into this sort of post-industrial economy. We're sort of in this complicated shifts, right? And their industrial jobs are moving and changing. And, you know, value is no longer linearly correlated with work, right? So if in a perf- in a typical industrial system, if I work more hours, I create more value in a relatively linear equation, right? Which is why an hourly wage makes sense. But in a world where one more hour of work might create 10x more value, but in the world we're currently in, all of that value goes to an investor and none of it goes to me as the worker, hourly wages make no sense. And it might be the case that if we did a better job sharing in that value creation and spreading the cost of disruption around more effectively, maybe we only need to work 30 hours a week. And maybe that is full employment. That's yet another equation that doesn't fully add up. The invisible hand of the free market is also the invisible variable to fuck over the average American worker. Work shouldn't be something you do just to survive. It it should mean something to you. And right now there are a lot of people doing a job they hate because it means nothing to them except survival. How many of us sit at an office job staring at the clock to hit 5 p.m. so we can go home to work on the hobby that we actually have a passion for? what, What if we can utilize our hobbies as a tool for survival? What if we can actually make money off of our hobbies to make a living off of it. And UBI in tandem will, with automation will help us get there. And we can't wait till we've replaced all the typists and the fast food workers and, and all the factory workers and so on and so forth. We have to put these systems in place before it's too late, before we get enslaved to greed and the robots. I mean, if we don't think about implementing UBI, we're headed right for the robot apocalypse. And nobody, nobody wants to live in the nightmare of the Terminator franchise. And for those that complain that this will just create a bunch of people suckling at the teats of the government. First of all, maybe those folks need a little bit of a break. right? And if it wasn't for a system that kept siphoning all the wealth up to the top... We wouldn't need something like universal basic income to rebalance the scales of the economy. But that's where we are right now. So the bootstraps ideology needs a little help. And looking at it as a rebalance takes the stigma away from this just being a handout. Some of the questions people ask about UBI are what's considered basic. It's the survival things, right? Like rent, food, utilities. If we can come to a point where we can get past just surviving, the world will invent things that we actually need, like homes for the homeless and a viable health care plan and probably more duct tape that can fix all of our home repair needs. It doesn't mean that you can't earn extra income to buy that sweet, sweet Mustang convertible. It just means that 
people will have access to food so they don't starve in a Corolla. The other question is, who gets UBI? Do children qualify? Maybe. I mean, it would make sense to a child who hasn't been indoctrinated into distractions and advertised propaganda and would probably use some of that money to fund education and probably also candy. The part where it does get complicated is when we factor rent into it. Right, This varies from city to city, but if we standardize the rent on square footage, number of bedrooms, and who's had sex in your home nationwide, it would reduce the rivalry between cities. If living in San Francisco costs the same as Boise, we'd get rid of divisive rhetoric like liberal elite and dumb conservative. It'd give a lot more meaning to the phrase location, location, location. So what do we need to implement something like universal basic income? Well, it can start with corporate profit sharing. Right, that ultimately what universal basic income is about is that we are collectively creating value and we should collectively share in that value. I believe in that 100%. I think that, that we live in a community where accepting the suffering of any of us makes all of us poorer and makes all of us less well off. Right, and accepting that that is like the default part of the gradient should be unacceptable to us. Is the answer government, like a minimum, a, gov a check from a government that creates a minimum layer? Maybe. It, that may be exactly the kind of public good that the government should create. It goes back to kindergarten. Sharing is caring. Which means that greed-based capitalism had, doesn't care and has failed kindergarten. And is that what we really want? Do we really want to be controlled by a failure? Universal basic income will return power back to we the people. The politicians and corporations that are against it are scared. They're scared that they're going to be beholden to us and not the figment of monetary imaginations. And they will lose power, their wealth, and their access to duct tape our freedoms. Necessity is the mother of invention and making capitalism necessary invents the false narratives that we only work to survive instead of progress and create universal basic income gives us worth in who we are and what we do the experiment of capitalism is failing and we are debating the solution A ubi can work so why not run the true great American experiment. Let's start inventing our solutions. I think people want to be rich. Every mainstream rapper talks about being rich and all they had to do was perpetuate a culture of excess and non-utilitarian things and then BAM! Some record executive will give you riches and riches bring you bitches and status and respect and power and sure it can't buy love but it can buy all the substitutes to love like the splendor of love but with your riches means somebody else remains poor and if you're a mainstream rapper it could be someone that tried to shoot you or or rob you or it could just be someone that called you fat in middle school but what if there was an economic system that didn't have the inherent flaws of poverty, scarcity, and wasn't a detriment to public health? Jacques Fresco, an architect, designer, and inventor, proposed we'd look into resource-based economics back in the 70s. This is an e economy not based in money, but rather allocating and accounting for the resources and their availability. Picture an island somewhere in the South Pacific, and you want to know, you really want to know, how many people can that island support, and to what degree can the extravagance of the island be maintained? First, you have to know how much wood there is, how much water, how much arable land. Once you do a survey of the resources of that island, that can best be the method for determining how many people 
I will support. If the materials do not exist, you can only design a culture based upon the materials that do exist. You can only grow food based upon the arable land area and the water surrounding the island, the fish, crustaceans, all the other things. And if you have an ag agronomist on your island, or a series of them, they can advise you as what is best to grow in that tropical region. So you really need technical competence in order to arrive at decisions that make sense. You know, basing an economy in what's real instead of an invisible hand that's been reaching up Mother Earth's skirt even though she said no a bunch of times and has even given you swine flu. Capitalism is a persistent little predator. Hyperbole aside, resource-based economics or RBE could be a way we resolve a lot of societal and socioeconomic problems. Peter Joseph of the Zeitgeist Movement and the author of the new book, The New Human Rights Movement, has outlined how this can work. First and foremost, a resource-based economy would have to take a look at the inefficiencies of the current capitalist capitalistic system and take care of all of them. And you have close to a billion people not getting their nutrition met, and you have what in an, by uh, Peter Edwards of Newcastle University put out what he called the ethical poverty line, which is based on lifespan, not the metrics put out by the UN. And when you use this ethical poverty line, you find that 60% of the world is actually in poverty. That is, is lunacy from an efficiency standpoint. No one can sit there and claim that this is an efficient system when that's the outcome on the social level. Now we can talk about the efficiency of a factory and you know, all the great fruits of technology that people will claim are associated with capitalism, which is nonsense too. It's our, it's our ability to design and, and our ingenuity through science and technology that's created this, not some weird mechanism that's attributed to capitalism. And what about food and waste? Uh, the waste is absolutely insane. You have 40 percent of all food being wasted because of inefficiencies in the distribution pipeline. Uh, which in is order to increase efficiency, we'd have to look at what is technically right. What is the fastest, most ethical, and safest way to make the things we all need? And if we take account of the real things instead of the unicorns that our current economy is based on, we can allocate how much of a particular resource we really need. So, sorry, mainstream rappers, it looks like your distractions of bling and spinning rims is now not only setting the black community from being empowered, but it's also making you look like an asshole. If we make the amount of things we actually need, rather than saying we need to buy more and spend more and be in debt more, right? we'd have the uh, right amount of necessities and less poverty and starvation across the planet with this model. This also helps us learn self-control and it's a return to modesty. It's the literal lesson behind less is more instead of what followers of capitalism say it is. Well, you know, less is more because when you have less, you're actually like more rich than the guy that wants you to be in debt by buying more of his shit. You know, also listen to this rapper we sponsored. He's a, he's a big believer in Jesus because hypocrisy is fun. This also means that we'd focus on a steady state rather than a constant growth. Now, within the capitalistic system, when the market skyrocket, it comes back down. Over the next several decades, capitalism is going to have to adjust to survive. In the stock market, when a stock gets too high and then comes back down, they call that a correction. I see a great correction coming for capitalism. I think capitalism 100 years from now is not going to look anything like capitalism This today. proves that the only law that capitalism obeys is the law of gravity. But we wouldn't have to worry about stock market crashes if we built a system that was keeping steady. Proposing a system that's built on exponential growth, a math lesson that most Americans slept through, means that we're constantly a nervous wreck about when it's going to crash. And if we're not, then we learned nothing from the story of Icarus or physics class. 
It's like dating someone you know is out of your league. And instead of enjoying that relationship of someone that loves you for you, you're wondering about when they're going to leave you because of something that your mother and your entire middle school class said about an insecurity you have. So when they're toasting you at Christmas dinner, you have a paranoid outburst about how this is all a setup, and and then you crash and burn. I I am sorry for slapping your grandfather in the face, Janine. At the moment, I literally thought that he was the Marvel comic books villain, Red Skull. This steady state would mean that we would be in a collaborative effort to maintain the system and make sure that everybody had the necessary resources to live a comfortable life. The way we live now is wrought with these childish thoughts of, well, they have more, so so I should want more. Basically, if you want to start adulting, then we can start looking into collaborating for the sake of the species. If not, I guess we can just remain in the state of arrested development of greed-based capitalism. And these systems would be run on automation, and this means that humans don't have to do dangerous, repetitive tasks, unless we want to, of course. Some of us are into BDSM even when it comes to labor, and I guess that's cool. But with automation, that leaves us to discover more things about this world that we are a part of, create and design more amazing things, and talk to that rapper about how their excessive behavior wasn't a real replacement for their mother's love. Now this leads us to access, right? With automation, we'd have access to pretty much everything. RBE would create a rental system or or like a library for certain things. Rather than having a property-based investment approach, value approach, which requires hoarding and in fact protection, we design a system of interchangeable access, like a rental or library system as we might see today. In a society where I, for example, might drive my car for only a few hours a week at most, does it really make efficient sense for me personally to store this vehicle where it will sit unused for probably 90% of the month? And if you extend that idea to the whole of the goods sector, the realization is that we can actually reduce production, create more efficiency, reduce the use of resources while, counterintuitively, simultaneously enabling more access of goods to the population when they need it. The term would be strategic access. And that's great, since all cars will be driverless and automated, an algorithm can now have a panic attack over parallel parking instead of us. So the question is, well, how do we know the demand of these resources, right? Then, And that takes us back to allocating and accounting for these resources, right? The demand will be accounted for, too. If it turns out that New York City prefers walking, uh, we would allocate them less cars and give a few more cars to, like, Iowa because they need it to get from one cornfield to the next. And all of this would be done with no money in mind. RBE would work on a non-monetary system. And this is the part where the opponents of this idea bring the hammer of capitalism down. The question on everyone's mind is, well, how will we know how what the value of something is? But the third thing is, how do you know without money if what you're doing is actually valuable to people? Right. That's and and this this sounds like it's materialistic, but it's really not. So if I um, if I give you a painting that I did, you're probably going to take it. Right. Right. Or three. Right. So if I just keep doing paintings and handing out paintings and I never charge anyone any money for them, I don't actually know if people like what I have or really care about what I have. I mean, they may say all these kinds of nice things, right? Here's a tape of me singing Ave Maria. Okay. <laughs> or here's an MP3. Fine, you know. But I don't know if I'm actually applying myself 
to that which is most useful and valuable and important to others if they're not bidding for me. And, and this means that we're going to have to be honest with each other and it's going to be okay to not like something, right? Because it doesn't make or break somebody's career. And at this point, we would have probably reformed the education system to include a class about how to engage and deal with your emotions. Self-reflection 101, really, or how not to be an asshole. Even the word career would have to be changed. When the idea of monetizing labor is out of the question and we're working on creating a better future for the, the global village, our passions are our careers. Instead of asking, what do you do for a living? People can ask, how are you living these days? Or an even more biting question, how are you contributing to the global human progress? It also means that intellect would be on the forefront rather than physical prowess or status. This also means that we don't have ownership over certain things. We need to use money anymore. If you really wish to put an end to war, poverty, hunger, territorial disputes, you must utilize all the world's resources as a common heritage of all the world's people. Anything less than that will remain with the same problems that you've had continuously for centuries. We all deserve to have food, shelter, water, health care, and education. And just because we've turned something into a necessity rather than a luxury, that doesn't mean that people can put a price tag on it to exploit other people's needs like skyrocketing the price of health care or pharmaceuticals or, or removing regulations on a utility like the internet so you can censor and weaponize information. All of these things would be inherent to every single person in the global village. The construction of cities would be very important to how we work within a resource-based economy. Jacques Fresco proposed a city to be built as a circle. The circular scheme or plan brings each district closer to the central dome, which contains the medical, food, shopping, everything else that people need. The circular arrangement makes it easier to operate using far less energy than any other system. And if you start at one end of the city and go through the city, you always return to the same place. Whereas in a linear city, you go to one end, you have to backtrack to get to the same point. So the circular scheme is by far the most efficient. Holy shit! We get rid of traffic altogether. Children will learn about an age where vehicles were traps for human anger management issues and highway side masturbators. The dark ages of the internal combustion engine. The city would be layered, set up for efficient travel, work, recreation, and solitude. And when cities are contracted in the future, they will be contracted as a whole, as an entire system. In that way, all of the parts and components would be delivered in stages. Like sequel one will be the underground, the heating system, the electric generators, the piping systems, the recycling systems, then after that, the next layer, which would serve as the first layer that contains the architecture, the foundations for all the buildings, and after that, the erection of structures up from the foundations. Starting with the central portion of the city, working its way out to the different radial sectors, and then out to the final housing sectors, and then to the agricultural belt, and then to the recreation areas. The cities themselves are prefabricated. Most of the elements that comprise the structures of the cities are interchangeable, interlocking. They are designed so they can be disassembled just as they were assembled. So the new cities will be updated continuously. As the waters are piped into the cities, they are checked. And to whatever extent contamination exists, the water processing plants evaporate the water, recondense it, 
and cleanse it. In other words, all waters piped into the city will be monitored constantly, not by a monitoring system, but several monitoring systems. The same is true of the air above and around the city. It's constantly monitored. All of the rooftops are photovoltaic. All of the skin, outer skin of the building, converts solar radiation into electrical energy. As we move beyond the third sector, we come to tennis courts, parks. Beyond that is the residential district, which consists of lakes, waterfalls, all kinds of beautiful plants throughout the area. And each house is concealed by plants, so you can't see another building. Some people prefer, as in the next sector, to live in apartment houses. The apartments have drama groups, recreation, swimming pools, discussion groups, and so many other facilities. The disadvantage of living in a private home is you would have to go to the various places to access the same things. Instead of motor vehicles in the city, all transportation is carried on by circular conveyors that we call transveyors. They move radially, circumferentially, and vertically. They serve the function of elevators, buses, conveyors. But if you wish to go to another city, you can take an elevator down beneath the central dome, which has maglev trains, etc., that will transport you to the center of any other city or any other region. There will be no waste products, just as in nature there are no waste products. All materials that we would formally call waste would be recycled and converted into new products. And that when the city hits a certain number of people, we stop the development and let everything go back to nature between this and the next city. It doesn't mean that we can solve all the problems. We can just design and build a far better environment to advance all human beings. Now, I know that was a longer clip than usual, but I figured I'd let Mr. Fresco do the honors instead of making another joke about our masturbatory habits. I have a steadfast rule of making only one masturbation joke per video. Now, I know this can sound like some strange utopia where everybody dresses the same and eats the same, but it's not. And that's the real fear here, right? That we'd end up living in these cookie-cutter cities, but what makes you think that we don't already? I mean, we live in apartment buildings that are made to look exactly the same, so we get confused as to where we live and just have to go spend more time in malls. All offices tell you to wear the exact same thing to have that professional decor, but fear not! You get to choose what shade of gray you get to wear. Amazon now has Amazon Basics where all the products look like bastardized versions of dinnerware from the Starship Enterprise. This is the illusion of choice we live in now. The illusion where we think we can own the entire Starship Enterprise, even though that was a television set. A resource-based economy will give us real freedom of choice. The choice to be who we want, live how we want, and create how we want for a sustainable future. We have the resources. Money is an interference because it limits our ability and it limits our dreams. It sounds restrictive when we say that resources will be accounted and allocated, but so much food and energy in our lives are wasted. So having a little control over those things means that we utilize finite resources a little bit better. The children of capitalism are going to have to grow up someday. And for fans of competition, it's not like competition is, would disappear, right? If there are only 200 pieces of diamond around, that means that every city only gets a certain amount of diamonds because that's how much is available. And that means that not every city wants diamonds, which means that a city that really wants those diamonds can get a couple extra pieces of diamonds. And not everybody in that city is going to want or get a diamond. It's like a first come first serve basis. It's like a buffet, but more sanitary.
And diamonds are just a, an example here, right? You can substitute that with anything. Like Iowa might not want to eat corn ever again, but Ghana loves it. That means that 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 this allocation finally means that math has a real world practical application. Holy shit, those SAT problems that we've all been complaining about has really been setting us up for a resource based economy. They made it into a hypothetical, but now we can actually make it happen. The current society we live in has eyes bigger than its stomach. Resource-based economics will help us learn and understand not only our limitations as a society, but also personal ones and be okay with them. Progress of society doesn't come with excess. It comes with being better about taking care of a growing population with finite resources and a limited amount of space. That's just a flowery way of saying we're eating this planet alive and probably shouldn't keep doing that. If we ever do figure out a way to get to a different planet and repeat the same course of action again, we're effectively going to become a virus on the universe, and the universe is a lot more vengeful than Mother Earth. Remember what it did to the dinosaurs? And that was only because they had a weight problem they weren't going to take care of. Putting more weight on our minds rather than monetary means means that we can cure diseases, create better and more sustainable options for food, better wrappers, without the restriction of the almighty dollar. And uh, look, I use another form of currency, but when you move away from the dollar, it tends to want to start wars with that entity. The dollar is fickle and desperate for friends, hence why it's so aggressive. And all it wanted was a hug from the founding fathers. Without the aspect of money, mistakes aren't a huge issue. If we run an experiment and muck it up, we start over. There's no pressure of disappointing investors or not getting a grant. As long as the resources are available, the pressures of failure and perfection are limited. There's still a chance that mothers will be disappointed though. I feel like there's no economic model that can get rid of mom guilt. You know, like that, that is a powerful force that rivals the universe itself. Even capitalism's mom keeps saying, you know, socialism is very nice to the mothers. And socialism's mom is like, you know, capitalism just bought a third house. And communism's mom says, are you sure that's your role in society? I feel like you can do better. Now, I will admit that this is a pretty large shift from our current paradigm that we're living in now. But there are options we can take right now that can help us transition into, into an economic system that runs on resources and ideas. Universal basic income is that transitioning step. UBI helps equate passions with careers, it places value on ideas and progress, and enables automation and advances our thoughts. A resource-based economy would take us out of the survivalist mindset. We are no longer cave dwellers that had to forage for food and make fire or else we'll die. We have these necessities that logically should be available to everyone so we can progress as a global society. And yeah, if you want bonus comforts, they're readily available as well. RBE is about global cooperation. If we slip backwards any further, we'll head back to the caves and money won't matter then. You know who doesn't care that you have a Rolls Royce? A pack of wolves that is hungry for your flesh. You are part of the predatory food chain regardless of what car you own. So money shouldn't really matter for the future. Consumerism and excess doesn't make humanity better. Spinning rims, a bigger house, and a brand name purse aren't sustainable. I mean, we can do better than just survive and want some riches. We can enrich our lives with progressing ideas, cooperative societies, and curious discoveries. We can start progressing and creating a better future where we live with the planet we're on instead of constantly trying to get in our pants. That's been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, 
if you enjoyed this video hit the like button give us a, a thumbs up and uh, and share share it with someone that you think would enjoy this video that you think would benefit for this video or uh, your enemies you know share it with someone that you uh, think would disagree with this and and might need to hear a different perspective uh, this uh, and if you want to support the show uh, my podcast, Taboo Table Talk, and socially conscious DIY independent stand-up comedy. You can go to my Patreon for, um, s s s I guess, sustaining membership is is how uh, public radio puts it. But if you want to be a monthly contributor to it, you can go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, but if you can't do something monthly and you want to just support it occasionally or um, you know throw some shekels here every once in a while, uh, I do have a PayPal donation set up as well. Uh, the link is in the comments uh, section or, or in the description section below. Um, and again, you don't have to uh, donate to get my content. All of uh, the episodes of Forkful of Noodles and Taboo Table Talk will be available for free um, every single week that I'm able to do it. Uh, donating to uh, the Patreon or through the PayPal um, helps me ma earn a living off of uh, doing and producing content like this because uh it's all just me guys uh it's just done by me i'm the only employee and staff member here uh so uh thank you guys in advance for supporting the show sharing the show and also donating to the show and uh we'll see you next week thanks for getting